Okay, apparently I am live on Facebook. Let's see if anybody is up late on Sunday night. Anybody up late on Sunday night? I guess there's people across the water where it's not night. I'll come on and uh, do some follow-up on some stuff that's been going on. All of those who don't tune in live can catch it in record later. Um, the uh, Megan Murphy thing is ongoing. I'll have some points on that. Uh, some other stuff that's been going on. Talk about some um, future stuff that's in the pipeline. Uh, where I'm going. Maybe talk a bit about uh, the whole concept of burning bridges. Um, people seem to always be concerned about uh, me and uh, whether or not I should be burning bridges. Um, I don't worry about burning bridges. Um, I've come to the conclusion that if you are honestly dedicated to the truth, that you're going to burn bridges in every direction. Okay. Following the truth uh, is almost a bridgeless uh, task, really. Um, so I don't worry about burning bridges, okay? And I deal with the uh, truth and facts as they come up, and I deal with them uh, the best I can. Hi, Joey. Hi, Paul. A bridge over, yeah, a bridge over troubled waters. I'm burning all of those bridges, and all I got now is troubled waters. <laughs> but I don't care, um, because, uh, like I say, the truth doesn't work that way, okay? Uh, the truth is not here or there. The truth is where it is, okay? And you have to go to the truth, and sometimes that means leaving people behind you. And um, that makes it occasionally a lonely, difficult path. But in my opinion, it is the only path worth following. Uh, the problem that we have, I think, in the world today is people are, well, I mean, there is a human impulse towards um, kind of tribalism and forming social collectives and groups and, and this type of thing. Uh, and it's in human nature. And I'm not going to say that that, that is, a, is a bad thing um, because unlike some of these right-wing radical individualist nuts, this is what is, has enabled humanity to survive down through the ages is our ability to work together. Okay, But uh, in that process, um, we've gotten into a time in human history where this uh, tendency towards forming groups and tribes uh, has been weaponized by uh, people who do not have the best interests of uh, humanity at heart. Um, and that's what we got to be careful about. So people say, well, uh, what you're doing is going against uh, somebody who's on the same side as you. Um, that's not the way it works, okay? The truth is the truth, and if you're really interested in truth, even if you're in a group, so even if you identify as, uh, you know, a, a liberal or a conservative, whatever group you want to put yourself uh, inside, um, there's going to be uh, points in time where your group is wrong, okay? And if you're really interested in the truth, you need to stand up and speak out about that. Now that means that you get chased out of the clubhouse or something, whatever, that's just the price that you have to pay. Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. And that was, um, was uh, Hannah, Hannah Arendt uh, uh, commented on this too. And one of my favorite old mystical writers, uh, Franz Hartman talked about this too, that people had this, 
uh, enormous bravery. Like they would go into the field of battle with weapons and in trenches and stuff. But uh, the, the thing that they feared most was the ostracism of uh, idiots, right? You get a whole collection of idiots together who are ostracizing you. People just, they're just terrified of being ostracized like that, right? Well, that's not the way I function. Um, part of who I am and why I'm in this debate and stuff and my sort of methodology for approaching things comes out of fate, really, uh, because I was constructed this way by the world. So I was an outcast uh, as a child. I was a foster child, rejected, uh, you know, moved from home to home, rejected in society by uh, schools and stuff like that. So I learned to be the outcast. So being rejected is nothing new to me. Um, so I can pursue the truth and be rejected and maybe handle that better than the average person can who is maybe used to always sort of going along to get along. I don't go along to get along. And that goes with this whole sort of uh, Megan Murphy thing that's come up recently and people saying that, well, I just need to, um, uh, you know, put all of these differences aside and because Megan Murphy and I are on the same side. Um, I don't see Megan Murphy and I as being on the same side anymore. I sort of tolerated Meg Megan Murphy for, for a long time. Um, keeping in mind that I've been in this dis debate now for three years and I think she's probably been aware of me all of that time. Um, she's in the same province as me. She's literally a 45 minute drive from me. She knows that I'm going against Soji123. She knows that I've been speaking in favor of women's rights and stuff. She knows all of the things that I've been doing. When I was under assault from UBC, she knew that I was under assault all over and uh, on the same subject that she was related to. And even though she wrote a article about free speech, in the wake of this firestorm that came down on me, she would not type my name, okay? And that was one of the big things for me, okay? That was when I don't care what anybody says about Megan Murphy. That was when I said, okay, something um, untrue is guiding this woman, okay? She's driven either by self-interest and greed or some other um, motive that has nothing to do with being interested in what's true and good. Uh, when she just sort of flagrantly, people say, oh, well, uh, maybe she thinks that you're too uh, uh, extreme a character or something like that, right? Well, she platformed and gave the, the, the thumbs up to Steven Crowder, uh, Milo, um, Gavin McInnes, but she would not even type my name, okay? Somebody who's on the left, actually, I'm left of center. I'm sort of an anti-establishment person, but if you want to sort of try to um, label me politically, I would say I'm left of center. Um, I believe our entire system is rotten, and I believe the elite corporate establishment has led that systemic rot you know, that needs to be dealt with if we ever want to get a, a true just society going. But um, uh, Megan Murphy claims to be on the left. I'm on the left of center. And yet she gives the thumbs up to all of these right wing figures, right? And ignores my existence, okay? I'm trying to push for uh, provincial and national inquiries into the transitioning of foster children and vulnerable children. She won't mention me. She won't mention my initiative. And she keeps saying stupid things like, um, well, I got no uh, obligation to give you any attention. You're just a man who's wanting, wanting my attention and I don't have to give you any attention. And she's completely blowing past the fact of what I'm trying to do. Right? I'm trying to get inquiries into this, right? They're in schools right now, brainwashing an entire generation to reject everything that she is saying. And yet she won't mention somebody who's been out there fighting it. I would say that over the last three years, I've been the number one person in British Columbia fighting SOGI 123 and these other initiatives. I actually got out and went into school boards and I've battled school boards for an extended period of time before I finally, <laughs> you know, gave that a rest. I might go after them again at some point. Um, but Megan Murphy wouldn't give me anything. So I have come to the conclusion that she's rotten. Okay. And I'm not going to apologize for that. 
Now, if uh, people want to go ahead and follow Megan Murphy for whatever reason, you go ahead. But don't expect me to support her. Okay, I'm done with her. And the fact that she's aligned with all these corporate ghouls now, right, the, the, the right corporate media and the guys of the National Post and uh, this little weasel, Jonathan Kay, who's uh, uh, Conrad Black, uh, uh, little uh, sort of whitewash uh, uh, apologist boy, right, getting all snuggly and cozy with every sort of corporate connected uh, um, pundit uh, around the globe. Uh, just sort of uh, is another thing that makes me say, okay, so um, is Megan actually part of the problem, right? And that's where we get into these some of these questions about uh, her a weakness on language, for instance, right? She's sitting there and she's got this uh, little corporate weasel sitting next to her who is shaming women for speaking the truth, right? Scolding them, calling them gratuitously impolite and shaming them in public for speaking the truth. And Megan Murphy just sits there and says nothing. She's supposed to be the great champion for, for women and for truth. And that she lets this little corporate weasel shame women. Okay, so that's just another sort of indication to me that Megan Murphy is not what people think she is. Okay. Yes, comrade. Well, <laughs> here we go, Max Comrade. It's the communist conspiracy. Um, this is one of the errors of the right. Okay, so I've dealt with people on the right politically in BC for going on three years now, right? I've dealt with them uh, in a sort of uneasy sort of relationship, but people at the grassroots level, right? None of these sort of corporate ghouls that talk, people at the grassroots level. And um, I think you always have to sort of separate people from their leadership to get a feeling for who they are. So most people on the right, so the PPC, I spent a lot of time sort of interacting with people who were supporting the PPC. I went to the three candidate, uh, three PPC candidate meeting uh, out here in Abbotsford when they had it and sort of interacted with the crowd there and it was quite a mix, but most of the people that I encounter on the right tend to be just good people who are interested in truth and justice and stuff, but I think that they've been led astray by the corporate ghouls who have managed um, uh, what we'll call conservative politics uh, in Canada, and not just in Canada, but in the States as well. And so we got these uh, loons like... Uh, um, Jordan Peterson, who's screaming all the time about the neo-Marxist conspiracy, which I say is bullshit. No neo-Marxist conspiracy. If you want to know uh, what happens when Marxism or communism emerges as a legitimate threat anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, you just look at the history of the CIA and the history of U.S. military and interventions in Central and South America, okay? When they have seen legitimate Marxist threats. They have dispatched, hired, trained, and put into action death squads that have murdered, raped, and mutilated children, okay, to send messages to Marxists. They don't put up with Marxists, okay? So um, this whole sort of communism thing, uh, to me, is... Um, is a distraction and it's a it's a deception and i think that uh, those good people on the right who want what's what's good and true need to realize that they've been deceived and they need to sort of bring that out of themselves too though because um, i mean i've been deceived multiple times in my life we have to admit that we're human and that we can be deceived and so even though something might be ingrained into our personality in terms of uh, you know, if there's an evil communist conspiracy out to, to get us, we need to be able to recognize the truth when we see it, okay? So this transgender thing, I think, is a perfect example of that. Everybody's going, oh, well, it's an evil Marxist conspiracy, and you'll see people marching with the communist flag at some sort of rally or something. But when you look at the actual numbers of actual card-carrying communists in, in North America, it's like negligible. Right. And if they and like I say, if they were a threat, the establishment would go after them. They're they're uh, a boogeyman. OK, you're supposed to look at them. OK, you're supposed to see them. You're supposed to see them as the enemy. You're not supposed to see the fact that this whole transgender thing was funded by the elite corporate establishment from day one and that it would not have gotten anywhere without their money. 
right? So who's to blame, right? Who's to blame for that insanity, okay? And why are they uh, putting uh, your eyes uh, on these uh, sort of uh, what I call phantom boogeyman um, troublemakers, if you will? The problem is, well, part of the problem is labels, right? Right, left, communist, Marxist. Well, these, these labels are, are part of the problem. Okay, people need to be interested in the truth. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, I describe myself as sort of uh, anti-establishment, left of center, right? But I don't even like to do that, really. Okay, what I'm interested in, in is is what's what I think is true and right. Okay, so I happen to believe that we as a society should not be letting people starve to death uh, or live in cardboard boxes on the side of the road. Right. I think that we as a society, uh, when we have little old ladies down the road who are, you know, being forced to um, almost live on dog food in some cases, and when they get sick and stuff, I think that we are, should, should care about them. Right. Uh, because there's an old saying there, but for the grace of God, go I. Right. I maybe understand that better than, than most people because I have no family. I have no social support network. So uh, when the shit hits the fan in my life, I'm going to be uh, in uh, a whole lot of trouble. So maybe there's some self-interest that, that, um, that drives me, but there should be self-interest uh, driving everybody because anybody's world can be blown to bits uh, in a moment. So there was this story, well, it was about a month ago or so, this... Um, father in Ireland uh, who um, basically lost his job and his finances collapsed, right? And uh, they, they weren't able to pay their bills anymore. And he got to the point where he realized that because he had uh, an ongoing life insurance policy, that he was worth more dead than alive to his family. So he killed himself. Okay, that is one like an indication of one of the flaws with our system okay we can't let people be destroyed like this okay we can't let people get into situations family people for instance where they're worth more dead than alive okay we need to 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 you know develop some sort of compassion and if you want to label my sense of compassion as a leftist or communist you can go ahead and do that but that's not the way i see it I believe that it has to do with being an empathetic human being. But yes, right there, you got it there, Max. They are useful idiots. And uh, I've talked about this, that this whole sort of uh, transgender madness is a dog whistle for people with psychological problems, okay? Now I get into trouble because I talk about psychological problems in the transgender community uh, all the time, but um, I'm not saying that all transgender people have mental health problems. I'm saying that um, uh, sort of the unusual nature of it makes transgender identity a dog whistle for people with mental health problems and it attracts them. And so you get a lot of them uh, uh, involved, and I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure you, Max, over there on the island, can think of some people who have these mental health problems who have been attracted to uh, transgender identity. Right? It's really hard for me to get uh, sort of ferociously angry at them because I believe that they have uh, problems, um, but they can become these useful idiots, right? These uh, uh, foot soldiers uh, for the establishment, right? People think, oh, they're foot soldiers for the for the left. No, they're not. Okay, right now the left is being uh, devastated, right? They're going down in opinion polls and stuff. And uh, part of that is happening while the, uh, what I call the right corporate establishment is cheering and funding them, okay? So the corporate establishment looks for all of these nut jobs and says, here's, here's money. <laughs> yeah, go out there and make a lot of noise, right? And then when they go out there and make a lot of noise, they go, look, look at the crazy leftists. That's what happened with the transgender thing. Um, so yeah, a lot of these people have become uh, useful idiots. But you know, where does the buck stop, right? So who's to blame, right? You take away all of that corporate funding and they're nothing, period.
Yes, and I hope everybody can um, uh, learn that, okay? Because um, I do have a left inclination and people will slam me with this uh, vicious communist label. It's like, okay, I'm with Noam Chomsky. I'm with George Orwell, right? People on the right are always quoting George Orwell. Well, George Orwell was over with me, okay? It's not a, really about being left. It's about having a sense of compassion, okay? And neither I nor anybody I've ever known on the left wants to set up a totalitarian state with gulags, right? So I'm sort of, I believe in sort of a social democracy. So I believe in kind of a hybrid system. I mean, you look at the budget that was just released in, in the United States by Donald Trump, right? And, you know, was it 700, 800 billion dollars for military, which dwarfed everything else in the U.S. budget, right? Um, now, I would say, okay, instead of putting nearly a trillion dollars into death and destruction and control, maybe we should move that towards helping humans instead. May maybe, would that be a terrible thing? Would that make me an awful human being? Some people on the right would say it, it does make me an awful human being, and I think they've lost their minds. Okay, so we need like a, a balance. Yes, the, the capitalism does have a certain accountability to it in terms of uh, it forces people out of their homes to, to, to work and stuff if they want to, um, you know, achieve some sort of um, you know, decent standard of living and stuff. So there's something to be said there. But capitalism has serious failures that you can see in any major city across North America, which have these huge homeless populations, right? But it's worse than that. A lot of the worst uh, things about capitalism are things that most people don't see, like this guy in Ireland, right? This the father who ended up killing himself. Um, you don't always see those things. That thing got that particular story got reported, but it's not the only case like that, right? So there are these failures in the system that we collectively have the ability to uh, deal with. Like uh, the right is more than willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars blasting the fuck out of the world. But when I say, well, maybe we should help people who are starving, they go, oh, you're a monster. You're a Stalinist and you want to put us all in uh, death camps and kill us. I'm like, oh, like, jeez. <laughs> anyway. Okay, I used to be low. That sense of compassion should operate within a state that steals from everyone. Who steals from everyone, Ryan? Okay, look at the budget in the United States. Okay, vast, vast uh, uh, majority of the funds uh, that Trump just uh, asked for uh, are for the military. Okay, he's supposed to be the great peacemaker, too. He's going to end all of these useless wars, he said, right? Meanwhile, it's a record high budget for uh, uh, military, right? Like, who's being stolen from? Like, I don't, uh, like, even in Canada, our military budget keeps going up and up and up and up and up, right? I don't support that. They're stealing from me, okay? I don't want them going out to uh, Afghanistan or wherever and killing people in my name. And yet they take my money, right? They take my money and they use it. That's socialism. That's communism. You're a bunch of Stalinist uh, monsters, you know? out there using my money for some sort of communist agenda to dominate the world. I could make that argument, right? So it's about, um, in many cases, it's about priorities, right? So where are your priorities? Right? Um, my priority is the first uh, order of business is making sure everybody has a minimum standard of living, okay? Letting people starve to death on the side of the road is not an option as far as I'm concerned. And people say, oh, well, uh, give to charity or something, you know? And then, then they give like a box of macaroni to the food bank every Christmas and say, look what a saint I am. Look what a uh, caring, giving person I am. I gave a ham to the, to the, the needy at Christmas time. Uh, well, the year is a lot longer. Christmas time, and that's not going to work. And the great sort of uh, charity workers throughout uh, the history of Western culture uh, came to realize that charity on its own was incapable of dealing with the problems uh, created by a brutal capitalist economy. So um, most people, like 
Uh, one of the great tricks, I would say, of the corporate establishment has been to turn Christians into these um, uh, compassionless uh, warmongers, really. Um, but that wasn't always the way Christians were. If you go back in time, almost all of the social programs in Canada that used to be good, okay, they've all been sort of eaten away by the corporate establishment, right? Our social programs back in the 70s were a hell of a lot better than they are today and uh, better managed uh, as well. But they've allowed that to deteriorate. But where did these programs come from? These programs came from what used to be called the social gospel movement and working people, okay? Not lazy bums in a gutter who wanted a free meal, working class people. And uh, the social gospel movement got together and said, look, um, uh, we can't, uh, as individuals, deal with all of the uh, problems that are being created by this brutal economy. We need social safety nets to provide a minimum standard uh, of living. So it was them coming together that created all of these social programs that used to catch people, right? Our, our social programs don't catch people anymore. That's why you got so many people living on the side of the friggin' road, right? It's because our... Um, uh, people talk about the, that we have like welfare and stuff. We have welfare, but it's pretty near impossible to get, right? And if you've been sort of devastated, as some people are, so some people uh, uh, who live on the side of the road used to be working people whose uh, worlds fell apart, right? And they've got psychological and emotional problems, right? If you've got the slightest uh, sort of problems along that line, our system is very unforgiving, okay? They'll let you live in a box on the side of the road and die, okay? That's unacceptable to me. But, again, so keeping in mind that uh, um, the social programs and stuff, uh, that's not, it's not robbing the people. That's uh, us coming together collectively and saying, listen, can we agree that a minimum standard of living? Okay, you don't want to take people who aren't working for whatever reason and shower them with, with wealth and gifts uh, and comforts. Um, so what somebody like me, I would say is no, but what you want there is like a minimum standard of living, okay? It's nobody should be living in a box on the side of the road. Everybody should have so like a minimum, um, uh, you know, food and, and stuff like that, right? Um, this type of thing, okay? Now that's not robbing the population, okay? There is theft that goes on in the population, but most of the theft that goes on in the population is not being done by communists. Uh, it's being done by uh, corporate ghouls and jackals and robber barons and, you know, all of these types of people, right? Where is that all those uh, hundreds of billions of dollars going into the military going? A lot of it's going into the military industrial complex, right? So I try it like I try to be like a, a bridge, right? I'm trying to be a bridge between political ideologies and say that, listen, uh, there needs to be some sort of middle ground here. And we need to understand, I think, collectively uh, as humans, that the primary enemy of humanity uh, right now is the current establishment and the muddied elite corporate powers that drive it, right? The whole transgender thing is largely a distraction that has been created by these corporate ghouls to take your eyes off the real villains in society. Right? That's why they're funding all these nuts. The more nuts out there screaming and behaving like maniacs, the better for them. Right? They can keep on robbing us blind constantly, which is what they're doing. So, well, you see, that's that's. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have to work at all if I had $4,000 a month there, uh, Ryan. I'd quit my job tomorrow. So that that's not the problem. That's a problem of uh, management and stuff. It's not a problem with the idea of um, dealing with a homeless person, right? And saying that we should give a homeless person uh, uh, some place to live. It is, especially in British Columbia right now, it's very expensive to live. Okay, and that's because, again, of the predatory system that we live in that has driven the cost of real estate and rent through the roof, okay? So it's become very expensive to live. Um, that's just another problem. So, so who's doing the robbing there, right? The homeless person uh, or the people who have made it so expensive to live in British Columbia now, 
right? The real estate is like a pretty good example, right? I don't own my home, right? I'm a renter. Uh, I uh, was forced to move four times in three years by real estate, what were essentially real estate speculators, right? And uh, people, uh, middle class people who reckon themselves good people, good Christians and stuff, but they use um, poor people in order to generate capital for themselves, right? And because everybody wants a piece of the pie, we've got this vicious real estate system in place that's just driving the cost of a home through the roof, right? Uh, I mean, I spend, I spend way more money on what is essentially a, a very old kind of rundown apartment building that I live in with all kinds of uh, druggies and, and nuts living in here. I shouldn't have to pay the amount of money that I am, uh, but that's just the way uh, real estate is right now. But I think you need to sort of focus on who's doing the robbing like this $4,000 a month. Well, that's just insane. Okay. But that's not the problem of the homeless people. And you don't go, okay, so this person, they say here that they're going to spend $4,000 a month. How is a homeless person, right? That's not the problem of the homeless person. That's not the problem of uh, people like me who say we shouldn't let them be homeless. The problem is looking at, okay, so whoa, whoa, what's with the $4,000, right? Um, now, if there was a will to deal with that, great. Um, but there's not really a will to deal with that because there's so many uh, uh, thieves involved in, in the project. And this is why I am sort of anti-establishment, right? I think that we have uh, such serious problems in society today that the system essentially needs to be gutted. Okay, the basic mechanisms, the sort of bureaucratic engines, you can kind of leave more or less in place, although we've got a lot of stuff that can go, right? Um, but we need to rework the system uh, in a way where it actually serves people instead of uh, serves uh, corporate and elite interests who rob the people using it, right? Um, so that's just the way I feel about that. This is an interesting thing. So corporate create war simply for power and profit. Yeah, power and profit. So one of the things is I've dealt with people on the uh, on the uh, right who are sort of on this sort of new world order kick, right? That there's a new world order uh, and they're trying to create a one world government and stuff. Uh, my feeling uh, about that is um, they can't have a one world government. It must always be at least two worlds, preferably three, right? Kind of like you saw in George Orwell's 1984, right? Uh, we must always be at war with East Asia, okay? Because the military uh, industrial complex, which is a trillion dollar industry, uh, needs to, um, you know, needs to make their egregious profits. And the only way they can do that is by being at war with somebody. Now they may get creative in the future, and this is a, uh, possibility I've considered, they may get creative and make it so that the, the war is a war between the establishment and internal enemies, right? Where the enemy is everywhere, sort of like you see in Israel, the enemy is everywhere, right? So that might be uh, something that they're looking at creating for the future, but um, I don't think you're going to see a one world government um, because the military uh, industrial complexes around the world uh, need war. And if you try to create global peace, I believe they have shallow graves in the desert uh, dug and waiting for you, right? Self-fueling system, the government could have easily come up with a better solution, but the proposal was to convert to jail of all things. Yeah, well, that's right, Ryan, but that's not... So that does not uh, say anything about the um, basic human compassionate impulse that we should not, like I can't, like I cannot even, I cannot bring it out of myself, right? To think that as a decent human being, that I could say to myself that somebody living in a box on the side of the road is okay. And that I'll just let that happen, right? I don't have the power to 
uh, house them and feed them myself, right? But collectively, we have that power, okay? And because I know that this is something that is wrong and repulsive to, uh, you know, everything human in myself, right? I continue to be focused on trying to, you know, deal with the system in a way to get it towards solving these problems, right? And some of these uh, $4,000 uh, solutions and stuff, um, in many cases, I think that's almost like a deliberate tanking, right? You don't need to spend $4,000 uh, per person. So this is just, to, to me, this is just another indication that we have systemic problems, right? So don't scrap the idea about housing people. Um, start looking at, okay, so what's going wrong here that allows this kind of insanity to happen? And how can we fix this, right? People are always throwing at me that uh, uh, my sort of uh, anti-establishment tear down the establishment and reorder society is like a pie in the sky dream. It's like, whatever, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? You're just going to give up and say, okay, well, let's just let this uh, uh, useless uh, system persist. Well, I know that's what the, you know, the mouthpieces like Jordan Peterson are saying, right? But I don't accept that. I believe that um, as long as we keep pushing, we can push uh, society towards a better state. But currently, I think the biggest problem that we need to realize that we have in society is that we have an elite corporate jackal uh, class that has seized control of the engines of power and they have corrupted everything. So they have to be identified and systems have to be put in place to keep them out. Okay, that doesn't mean, you know, smashing the capitalist system or anything like that. It means that these corporate powers and moneyed interests need to be kept away from the levers and mechanisms of power. Okay, and until we get these scumbags out of government, we're going to continue to have problems. So this is one of my things that I'm on. So I had this little uh, uh, debate with Paul the other day uh, about uh, my views as uh, being, you know, anti-establishment. He said, well, you're going to be chasing ghosts your whole life, uh, which I thought was kind of a uh, you know, little insulting and demeaning. So I had a sort of a strong response for him. And um, my response is that, um, you know, the establishment, what is the establishment? The establishment is a machine. The faces of the establishment are ever-changing, constant shifting, right? If you go looking for uh, a particular person or organization to blame, uh, you're going to be uh, looking forever because they're constantly shifting and changing, and it's never one thing. So I talk a bit about the Trilateral Commission, right? And this is sort of a nexus for a lot of scumbags. But you could go after the Trilateral Commission and dissolve it, and then we just go somewhere else. But the mechanisms of control that are being used to brainwash and control the population are still there. And so when I talk about the establishment, that's what I talk about. So I talk about... Um, Operation Toto, right, in this uh, pulling back the curtain. And I say it's not pulling back the curtain so much to expose the old man. Yes, you want to expose the old man who's pulling the levers. But you want to, what you want to get at is you need to get at those levers and mechanisms that they are using to control and manipulate people. Okay, Those levers and systems of control and manipulation need to be, first of all, identified and revealed to the population. And then they need to be brought under control, right? So part of Operation Toto is about exposing how the elite corporate establishment is using, for instance, intelligence operations to control uh, the population through various methodologies, just one of which is um, intelligence infiltration of the media. Now, you tell people that the, that the media is full of intelligence assets, and they'll go, oh, well, that's a crazy conspiracy theory. Um, it's actually not a crazy con uh, conspiracy theory. There's a long documentable history, and there is absolutely no reason to think that the, uh, this history has uh, changed. In fact, it's uh, reasonable to assume that it's 
become much worse and there's a ton of evidence to support that it's become much worse. Uh, the idea that there are intelligence assets controlling the media and controlling what people think by manipulating the media is documentable, okay? But most people don't know that and if you suggest it to them, uh, they think you're crazy. So that needs to be brought to an end okay people need to come to understand that this is uh, something that is real because when you watch cnn or you watch fox okay and if uh, if you're oblivious to these uh, mechanisms of control and uh, manipulation um, you will take that information as good information but when like if you come to realize that there's a very good chance that the talking head that you see on cnn or fox is an agent of the establishment that changes everything right so we need to expose that we also need to expose some of these other mechanisms that they use to um, manipulate people and that's a, a long hard difficult uh, process and it's part of what i am trying to do and it's probably one of the reasons why i would say i am sort of the most censored and effectively censored person in, in British Columbia right now. I mean, have almost every door you can imagine has been slammed in my face by the establishment. And that's because I think that they realized uh, when the, uh, the establishment looked at me, and they have looked at me, I mean, you talk to uh, uh, Adam, for instance, who came with me to the one uh, meeting there where I feel I was being studied like a bug. Um, so when they looked at me, they realized that I was quite different. So you can look at Megan Murphy, you can look at, say, Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson or Kerry Simpson or any of these other people who've been opposing the transgender agenda in BC. If you compare them to me, you're going to see something radically different, okay? Because most of them just sort of throw stuff out there. They're not sort of deep researchers and stuff, and it's just a lot of uh, stuff that can easily be discounted as hyperbole. But when you look at my presentations, they are heavily researched, right? And I document everything. Right. So when the establishment looked at me, they went, OK, we've got a problem here. <laughs> well, we need to shut this person down. Right. Last thing that they want is not just me, but uh, me times 10. Right. So get other people out there. Right. So some people who have listened to my, my talks have said that I need to clone myself. And that's uh, uh, probably exactly right. Difficult because part of who I am and what I am is that I'm OCD and that's sort of what makes me unique and why my presentations are so uh, heavy uh, duty. Um, but if I can get people uh, into a room, I can, I believe that I can uh, change their minds. And if I have to do it uh, you know, 10 people at a time uh, over and over and over again, I'll keep doing that. Um, it's very difficult to work through the censorship, but part of my project um, like when I started on this project, I was focused mainly on um, dealing with uh, the insanity of uh, transgender uh, ideology. But uh, as I, I should say, when I first looked at it, when I first did sort of analysis, I kind of recognized immediately what I thought to be um, intelligence strategies being utilized, but I couldn't quite figure out Okay, what exactly are they doing with this? What is the, the end goal here? The control of speech and stuff like that was alarming to me, and that suggested that there was some sort of a totalitarian undercurrent going on. Um, but the more I've looked at it, and the more I've dealt with the establishment myself, personally, uh, the more I've been convinced that we have a very sort of nefarious um, system in place that is trying to basically lock down the human mind okay and so whereas my primary focus was just transgender issues when i got started my new talk tour that's going to begin in hopefully in march is going to be a split right down the middle okay so i'm going to look at the the, the transgender issues and all of the insanity of that but i'm going to contrast it and i'm going to show um, these mechanisms of power, control, and manipulation that we're talking about. So I want to uh, reveal to people uh, the reasons why they need to understand that we are essentially living in an information matrix, okay, where our minds are very carefully controlled and manipulated all the time. 
And um, if I just say that, like in a Facebook uh, live uh, uh, broadcast, it's easy to sort of uh, just sort of dismiss me as some sort of conspiracy kook or something. But when I start actually providing the evidence and the documents and stuff, um, that changes everything. Uh, the reason I like to do it uh, uh, in public talks um, is something I don't always talk about. I occasionally mention this in my public talks um, is because in... I got flack from from people in the past saying, "Well, why aren't you broadcasting your your talks on on the internet?" And the reason I don't uh, do that is because I want people to want to know what I'm talking about, right? And it's not just wanting people to want to know so they'll get out and come to my talk. Uh, it's because um, that forces into the room, into my midst, a very special kind of person, right? Not just uh, the average person. The average person will watch a YouTube video, whatever, they'll watch it, they'll go, oh, that's interesting, and they'll close it, and they're done with it, right? Uh, the people who come out to my talk are a special class of people, okay? They're people who are willing to get out, get up, get out, and do something. These are people I'm interested in. So when I uh, hold a public talk and something or, or this type of thing, I get names and email addresses so I can contact them uh, later. I have a, a big list of such people, and I'm going to continue to compile uh, uh, my my list um, for people to sort of um, who who are interested in truth and justice and who are willing to get up and and, and get out. Um, the establishment thinks that they've uh, silenced me. And they've done a pretty good job. And maybe they think that they're just going to smother me out of existence and I'm going to go away. What they're going to find is that uh, I'm far from done. I'm just getting started here. And uh, hopefully uh, more and more people will come on board with me. And hopefully it's people from both sides of the spectrum, the so-called left and the so-called right, who recognize, who can sort of uh, agree that the problem isn't so much these transgender loons and stuff, right? The problem isn't so much uh, whether you're left or right. Uh, the problem is we have a corrupt establishment, okay, and engines of manipulation that all need to be addressed. And if we can sort of agree that it's these elite corporate jackals who are the primary problem in society, okay, well done, all right, let's get together and let's recognize collectively that this is the problem and uh, we need to get their hands off the levers of control. Mm, I missed something here. There we are. Military and corporations, democracy is dying. We don't have democracy right now. Democracy has been dead for a long time. Uh, you don't uh, elect leaders. Um, leaders are selected for you and you get to choose which uh, um, corporate shill uh, you want representing you. Uh, the choice that you tend to get is a choice of um, social things that don't really matter, okay? Um, key issues are not something people get to, to rule on, and that's by design. So if you talk, as I have talked with some of these uh, sort of elite academic uh, um, intelligentsia sorts and stuff, um, what you'll find is this sort of um, collective agreement that the average person is an idiot. And I'm not necessarily going to disagree with that. Okay, but their attitude is that because the average person is is an idiot, uh, that uh, the last thing in the world that we we want is democracy, a real democracy, right? Uh, the 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 masses of the people are not a democratic force to be responded to; they are a problem to be managed. Okay, that is the attitude of the elites in our society, and it's on both sides. Whether you're talking to the left or the right or center, whatever, they all have the same attitude. But I happen to sort of be uh, in the same uh, mindset, again, as Noam Chomsky in that regard, because Chomsky said, yes, okay, so the average person may not be that educated, may not be uh, the brightest bulb on the tree and stuff like that. But the, the collective mass of humanity 
in a moral sense is far more trustworthy than these elite jackals that are running the world right now because um this hierarchy that that uh, jordan peterson is always trying to justify right the existing hierarchy is set up in a way that favors sociopaths and psychopaths right and that's not hyperbole okay this has all been sort of uh, uh, confirmed through psychological studies and stuff that our system is designed that the worst sort of human beings end up at the top right uh, that's a problem. Something needs to change there. And that's part of what uh, some of the feminists are, are, are pointing out, too. Um, my relationship with feminists is actually kind of uh, uh, interesting, okay, because um, when they talk about a patriarchy, right, and the fact that men dominate most of the key positions in society, okay, you look at top executives in Wall Street, and there was, uh, you know, there's some crazy imbalance, right? Mainly men, mainly sociopaths, mainly psychopaths. So there's something to be said for those women who say that um, it might be better that in the key positions of society, we had more balance, right? So uh, the rulership positions were more reflective of, well, you can start with uh, uh, sex. So if we had sort of more or less 50-50 split between men and women, that would be great. I actually uh, had this idea at one point that what might be ideal is for every, um, at least at the political level, every writing should have a uh, female representative and a male representative, right? It's a little more expensive, but it gives you more balance in the system. Instead of all of these sociopaths and psychopaths and these guys pumped full of psychotic testosterone constantly running the world and this smash the opposition um, psychology, get a little more balance in there where you got people in there who aren't these vicious doggy dogs, right? Um, but the, like even that, you're creating a balance, but that's not anti-democratic. It's still democratic. It's just saying, okay, we want to be, um, you know, more representative of the population and stuff. And um, maybe set up a system where, um, you know, greed and psychopaths and social paths uh, aren't what uh, is valued. So again, so at the top, we have these ghouls. So if you want to trust them in terms of morals, and doing the right thing and stuff, good freaking luck, <laughs> good luck. And that's what Chomsky talked about, that yeah, the bulk of the population is not as educated, but on moral issues, they're generally more trustworthy as a collective body, right? So that's why democracy is, is in my opinion, a good thing. Right, systems of accountability. So I would make um, I would make political corruption one of the most serious offenses in society. I would put it at the level of treason. Okay, any politicians found to be engaged in uh, corruption uh, against the public interest would be essentially charged with treason. That's what I would do. I would create very strict laws about corruption. Um, I think there's something to be said for making sure your politicians don't have the incentive to be bribed. So if we're going to, like we agree that we pay well, we don't agree, but the society generally, uh, the people who are at the top of organizations tend to be extraordinarily well paid, right? Uh, I would say that it's probably reasonable to suggest the same thing for politicians, okay? So if it's, it's, a, it's better that we, the people, bribe these politicians than somebody else bribe them, right? So make sure if uh, somebody becomes a politician, that uh, A, they understand if they violate the public trust that there's gonna be serious consequences. Uh, but B, uh, take away the incentive for them to be bribed uh, by giving them everything they need. Now that's not gonna take away what they call non-pecuniary uh, conflicts of interest um, or direct uh, infiltration. Um, but we need laws, I think, in place.
Crowdsourcing what, Ryan? Not sure what you mean. I don't see it. the government doesn't want it solved. I don't know. The government uh, essentially, they say it like there's a Smedley Butler, famous quote from Smedley Butler was that war is a racket, right? I would say government is a racket. And it's a racket largely that's run by the corporate establishment. Um, I believe it was uh, one of the Carnegie's. Uh, I've got a quote somewhere. I wish I could find that quote. But um, he was talking in the early 1900s about how um, political control of just one small town could be worth millions to you, right? Um, so corporations and uh, these corporate jackals have understood for a long time uh, that uh, government is a racket and it is uh, a way of robbing people. Um, but again, this isn't communists that are robbing people. This is um, robber barons. Um, and they largely don't care about homeless people. That's right. They would rather uh, $800 billion go into uh, the military because they can invest in military shares and stuff like that, right? Uh, if you put $800 billion into uh, feeding and housing uh, people, well, you know, where's the profit in that for them, right? Um, and it tends to be very sort of special corporate interests that control the mechanisms of power. So the military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical complex, um, you know, big oil, all, all of these type of things. Um, the more sort of generalized um, uh, corporate interests don't have as much control. I think uh, new tech is beginning to emerge as one of those powers, though. Um, but once again, they're interested in uh, what makes them profit, not what helps people. It's uh, profits over people. <clears throat> uh, we're in a dire situation in our society, generally speaking, like just generally, uh, not just the, the whole poverty question, um, but generally, uh, we're in a, in a very bad place in history. I believe that we are on the brink of falling under complete totalitarian control. And one of the, uh, I'd say the primary control mechanism is control over the means of communication. And that's why we see this move to crack down on the... Um, internet, social media, digital media, various sorts, is because it threatens their control matrix. So they have to find some way to get control of that. And they're doing that very effectively right now. And it's actually morphed during my time in this debate. When I first entered this debate, I could communicate fairly well on uh, social media without too much restriction. Within about a year, um, I started expense, uh, experiencing heavy censorship, uh, what was it, about a year and a half ago or so. I was totally nuked on Twitter. Um, Facebook has repeatedly uh, suspended me. I've probably spent six months of the last year in suspension. Um, but but uh, So that was a change to, to more censorship, but we've seen over the last year or so uh, another switch in how that censorship is implemented. And what seems to be happening now is they realize that uh, coming right out and um, banning people like me, for instance, is too overt and too obvious. Okay, So what they seem to be implementing now, and Facebook hinted at this in the last time I saw them give a press release, what they seem to be focusing on now are mechanisms of uh, what we call throttling. Right. So reducing exposure uh, in that way, you can essentially ban somebody without them even knowing that they're being banned or being able to say that they're being banned because you've in implemented these, excuse me, instruments of control uh, behind the scenes that nobody can see. And um, every government everywhere is moving into arrangements. Public where the the uh, 
legal bodies are saying to the corporations, you must censor, right? But they're not actually taking the responsibility for censorship. That's just kind of generalized, right? And uh, the corporation is, is saying, okay, well, we're going to censor, but it's not really our fault um, that we're censoring because the government has told us that we have to censor. So they don't have to take the blame for it. They say, well, it's not our fault. The government says we have to censor. And then you go back to the government and the government says, well, yeah, we told them they should censor, but we didn't tell them exactly how they were going to censor, right? So it's this past the hot potato and nobody ever takes responsibility. But what you end up with is a complete lockdown, right? Uh, but now it's becoming uh, this insidious, uh, invisible lockdown. And one of the best sort of illustrations of this is what's, uh, what I observed on my YouTube. So I had my, my uh, YouTube video, I forget which one it was. I think it was the one where I'm calling for a government inquiry, where I sat and watched it for a while. And it went from, you know, while I was watching it over a 15-minute period, it went from like, uh, you know, like 800 views down to... 750 views, then down to 700 views. Then I went back up to 810 views, and then it dropped down to 650 views. Uh, but the end of the game was, it was like this back and forth sort of a tennis match. The end of the game was that I ended up with less views during that period of time. And what that is, is a form of uh, mind control in the sense that uh, um, because there's so many uh, videos and stuff out there, a lot of people, when they go to watch a video, they'll try to determine whether or not they want to watch that video by how many views there are, right? And uh, the views will, um, you know, if the views are too low, they'll say, okay, well, nobody's watching this, nobody cares, so I'm not even going to bother with this video, and off they go. So it tells the potential viewer that this video isn't very important, and it tells me as a producer of the video, why don't you just give up because nobody's watching? So this is a psychological game that they're playing, okay? It's a, an invisible mechanism of manipulation. Um, so my sort of tip to people when you're going out there to watch uh, videos, especially videos on politics, um, don't pay attention to views. Don't let uh, how much a, a video has been viewed tell you um, whether or not that's something you should be watching, right? Let the content speak for itself. Uh, for people who are producing YouTube videos, don't get discouraged because your views are low because you don't know what the real views are. Uh, and this the, the illustration I gave of that one case, I did that multiple times. I've observed that multiple times on multiple different videos, and other people have uh, observed this too. There are silent mechanisms of manipulation in place. That's another thing that's going to need to be um, addressed because... Um, if the elite corporate powers are allowed to use these mechanisms um, uh, of communication on the internet and stuff to manipulate the public mind, everybody needs to have equal access to that. So these invisible throttling mechanisms need to be uh, identified and taken out of existence. Okay, currently, uh, people who are talking about controlling uh, social media uh, companies are uh, too often have got uh, uh, you know discussion about um, you know what they're going to allow them to control. To me, it's like uh, for the most part, social media doesn't need to uh, do any censoring whatsoever uh, unless instructed to by law enforcement, right? So if somebody's defaming somebody, well, there's legal measures. Like if I in this video say something defamatory to somebody, well, they can just uh, uh, you know screenshot the video or download the video or bookmark the video and uh, take legal action against me. Same thing with, uh, you know, calling for genocide or, you know, some of this stuff there. There's no reason for social media to have to get involved uh, um, at all. So uh, I would uh, uh, want uh, social media uh, regulated in, in a direction of freedom. Oh, yeah, education is being destroyed in effort to stop rational thinking. Now, that's not new, though, Jetta. That's not new. Um, 
Rockefeller, I think it was, way, way back in like the 1920s or something, was saying that uh, education should be minimized, right? People needed to be just smart enough to pull the levers and no more, right? They shouldn't be uh, getting involved in politics and the dumber they were, the better. So that's not something uh, new. Okay, so the levers are being given a mind of its own. Levers are not being given a mind uh, of its own. Um, the mind is are those ever shifting amorphous faces, and they uh, meet together like places like trilateral commission and stuff, and they have general uh, consensus and agreement upon which lever is going to be pulled where, right? Um, so it's not that the, the, the levers have a mind of their own, it's that uh, they're being manipulated by uh, an, uh, like um, elite powers, and, uh, corporate interests and stuff, who have their own idea about the way the levers and the mechanisms of power should be used. Um, so, you know, Imagine, like, imagine a society where we actually, instead of uh, uh, going into school, just just take this one example, okay? Rather than going to all of these kids in high school, for instance, and teaching them about 200 different genders and every possible sexual fetish imaginable, right? Instead of going in there and teaching them all of this and telling them how to put on condoms and, and all of this stuff, imagine if you spent all of that time on teaching uh, young people about how populations are manipulated by their governments. Imagine if uh, understanding propaganda and media manipulation was required learning for all high school students. Imagine that, right? I would, like if I was the Minister of Education in British Columbia, I'd want to make sure that the curriculum included something that would empower young people coming into the world who are going to be voters, right, when they get to be uh, 18, educate them and prepare them for the world that they're gonna come into Listen and say, listen, you know, when you start getting into political subjects and stuff, uh, there's gonna be like a mass of people who are gonna try to warp your brain. So let's just take a look at the way um, corporations and elite powers manipulate uh, people and have manipulated people over the breadth of time. That would be required education in all schools if I was the education minister. Imagine how much more empowered uh, people would be. Well, the patriarchy is, is interesting. Um, because it exists, right? So it, it's hard to like it's hard to look at that Wall Street and not see that it's almost entirely men running it, right? So that's a real thing, but that's a systemic problem again. Okay, so now well, it's like it's a complicated subject, but a large part of that is a systemic problem in that. Um, men typically are just sort of on average better suited for social pathology and psychopathology and tend to be much more aggressive than women in general and that's part of the reason why they're at the top of our society because our society favors people like that so jordan peterson's great solution for women um, becoming more represented uh, among what we we'll call the ruling class, uh, was for women to get meaner and nastier. Like, what a great solution for society. Let's make people meaner and nastier, right? Um, that's not a solution as far as I'm concerned. Now, the odds of me going anywhere slim to none. The uh, establishment is doing its best to totally snuff me out of existence and uh, 
my associate uh, in this unwilling associate, uh, Megan Murphy, is uh, working hard with them to make sure that uh, my voice is never heard. Yes, they have. Okay, so, but that's, this is what, what I call a right-wing buzzword, uh, social justice indoctrination. Got to be careful there. Okay, so yes, they are using, I guess, what you might call social justice, but it is, um, it's not because the establishment itself cares about social justice. It's because it's uh, distractionary. And you'll know that so much of it is about identity. Okay, so people talk about um, how uh, it's the left that's driving this, but the, what people are calling the left today, right, is not the left of yesterday. The left of yesterday was Noam Chomsky and George Orwell, right? That was the left, and it was about, um, again, developing a sense of human compassion. It was about uh, economics. It was about uh, class uh, differences, you know, ruling class and uh, working class and, and these types of things. That was the left, but the left now has been redefined into this identity politics, right? But that's got like that's 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 uh, a complete distraction. That is like identity politics is a destruction of the left. That's what it is. It's like uh, putting a time bomb in the left and blowing it to pieces, and everything that's important is being destroyed. I happen to believe that that's deliberate. I believe we have the corporate ruling class who decided they want to totally destroy the left forever, and that's what we see going. Now, there are people on the right who say, oh, good, they're going to destroy the left. My uh, personal thing is that society uh, benefits from this struggle, right, from having these uh, kind of a dialectical process, thesis, antithesis. There should always be a thesis and antithesis and uh, back and forth. And, you know, sometimes the, the thesis will win and sometimes the antithesis will win or sometimes there'll be a synthesis, right? But you need that struggle. So to have the corporate uh, establishment uh, deliberately targeting the left for destruction, I think is bad for humanity. And I think that's what we see going on right now. And I'm in the process of documenting that. But, you know, a balance of handmaids and men. No, no, that's exactly it. So um, Jordan Peterson said that the solution was to get, um, you know, women meaner. I don't think that that's the solution. I think... Uh, uh, women should be more represented in our system and equal representation as per the population, right? It's completely within uh, democratic principles, right? It may not be uh, consistent with what uh, Jordan Peterson would call a meritocracy, right? But it is uh, consistent with the idea of a democracy in representation by population, right? So I would say no, not handmaidens, uh, not women who have been instructed how to be good men, but women who are just women, right? Uh, and uh, women tend not to be the crazy warmongers that men are for the most part. And these types of women, I think, could only benefit society by being put into positions of power. There's so many feminists out there that just loathe me and hate me. No matter what I say, no matter what I do, they loathe me, they hate me. Um, but I'm actually a friend of, of feminism, but what I call sort of a sensible feminism, okay? So the, the feminists out there, and I've seen a lot of them coming out of the woodwork since my little blow up with Megan Murphy, uh, the feminists out there who just, you know, all men are evil. Uh, sorry, that's just going too far because it's not true. Yes, men are more prone to being nasty on average, right? Yes, they're responsible for most crimes and stuff, but that's not all men, okay? There's an awful lot of good men out there. I've never raised a hand towards women in my life. I've never, you know, tried to do anything um, harmful uh, to, to a woman. Um, so 
I mean, other than maybe disagreeing on certain things, but that's an uh, intellectual thing and all of that is fair game. Um, but other than that, I think I am a friend of feminism because I think that the women should be more equally represented in the mechanisms of control. And I say that not on a socialist communist uh, or from socialist communist perspective, but from a democratic perspective, because representation by population, I think should represent sex too, because um, there are significant issues of sex out there. And this trans thing is a perfect sort of illustration of that. Right. Okay. So it's hard while males are around, female layers are too often trampled. And that gets right into Jordan Peterson's uh, insanity, right? Where women just need to become meaner and nastier, right? In, in order to uh, take the reins of power. But men are just naturally meaner and nastier. They've got higher levels of testosterone and stuff. They've got bigger bodies and they just tend to be that way. So that's not the solution. The solution is not to try to get women to compete with men on the nastiest level so they're not trampled the system uh, the idea or the ideal in my opinion is to create a system that's more representative of women as they are and that is um, almost separate from men so that's my whole idea to sort of deal with the whole imbalance of, of women was this um, split democratic system where every sort of riding would have a female rep and a male rep that's pretty balanced right and then the female rep it doesn't matter what the male says right because the females are there and if you get women together women to, in, in groups are not weaklings you get women together in groups and uh, it's it's difficult to trample them women sort of isolated in a group of men might tend to get trampled right but women as a group are powerful right so my solution would be to get a group of women um, to create more balance in society under democratic principles Hi, Catherine. The crowdsourcing, Ryan, is is just charity. It's just a new form of charity. You know, I've uh, had to do crowd for, uh, sourcing for what I uh, have been doing over the last two or three years. Trying to raise money from people among all these competing interests is tough. And as I've said before, the experts of crowdfunding, which is what charity was. I mean, charity used to be uh, even... Um, I mean, what the, you've got like Facebook is really easy to organize. Charity used to be more powerful in the past when you had, say, the social gospel people, right, who uh, spent so much uh, time uh, on charity. They would go out and they would go door to door to door to door of business and stuff looking for money. Okay. That was like right in your face and hard to ignore. And uh, they found that crowdsourcing of any sort, like uh, charity of any sort, has failed over and over and over again. And that's why they made this original push to create social programs, because they said, look, charity can't solve the problems, okay? Only a collective effort, right, uh, can, can solve these problems. And it has to be, it has to come out of the will of the people to recognize these problems and say, like, I care, okay? So you can say, well, if people care, they should donate. Well, most people would rather spend their money on a new PS4 game, right, or whatever, right? Um, and so the problem just, uh, well, it's not my problem. I'll just ignore it, and they can starve to death on the side of the road or whatever, right? That's what happens, okay? So the social gospel movement came along and said, listen, you know, okay, you're, you're willing, people are willing to pour these billions of dollars into a war machine to blast the fuck out of the world. And I come along and I say, well, maybe we should take that money and use it towards uh, life instead of death. And people will say, oh, you're a monster. You're, you're a Stalinist communist monster and you want to set up gulags and kill everybody. 
<laughs> that's what I get from Jordan, Jordan Peterson and the people on the right. It's like, are you insane? Are you out of your minds? Right? This is a management, uh, an economic management problem. And it's recognizing that we have tried the charity road for uh, uh, solving these uh, problems, real problems. Go to any major city, right? Uh, there's people living in poverty and misery and on the side of the road, every major city in, in the Western world, right? Um, and charity hasn't been able to solve those problems. We still have charities and stuff. They crowdsource all the time. You've got Salvation Army, all these different uh, people out there. Um, but, uh, and then there's, just, you know, private charities and stuff uh, tend to be um, exploited. Okay. I'm not going to mention any names, but I worked with somebody who raised a whole lot of money uh, towards dealing with this um, transgender problem. And they uh, said that they were going to do certain things with that money. Uh, and then they just never did. And uh, where all that money they raised went to, I don't know. Okay, Every dime I've ever been given directly to fight this transgender thing, I put back into the fight. Not, not just every dime more so i've actually gone into debt doing this okay but there is a whole predatory um uh, culture out there in in, in charity where uh, people are milking it right and that's a part of the, the the problem so again if if you can get like uh, a system in government where you say okay instead of blasting the the, the fuck out of iran um uh, let's take uh that money, or at least half of that money, and let's put it towards uh, life instead of death, right? But then you set it up in a system that uh, is not corrupt, okay? If you leave it out in private, it's going to be, you know, every con man and his dog is going to continue uh, uh, bilking people. And the problem is, is that people will give money uh, to uh, charities and stuff. They'll get robbed and that tells them in the future. Okay. Well, I'm, last time I gave money to a charity It was just some scam artists and off they went right and this is just repeated and over and over and over and over again You get rid of that problem if you make the charity the government right and But then you have to make sure that it's managed properly and you're not doing stupid things like spending four thousand dollars a month to house somebody right um, it's got to be set up in a proper way. We have serious problems right now, uh, systemic problems that have been created by an elite corporate uh, a tyranny, right? And I'm not going to say that it's easy, but this is the direction, in my opinion, that society needs to go. The answer isn't just uh, saying, oh, well, you know, donate a ham at Christmas and, and that'll feed the poor. Right? Okay, so this is back to this this whole argument uh, here. Okay, I have already said that what I favor is a mixed economy. Okay, so what they call social democracy. Okay, so what that that says basically, you say that um, if you uh, you know that they they might want to work or something. First of all, some of the people on the side of the road can't work. Okay. Um, but we've got uh, a uh, welfare system in place right now that I happen to know, having uh, dealt with people who, who uh, work in it and who have interacted with it and studied it. We have a welfare system uh, in place right now that is um, extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to qualify for and extraordinarily difficult to keep. Um, furthermore, uh, it pays almost nothing. Okay, so we, you don't want to create like a, a system where there is no incentive to work, okay? But uh, anybody who uh, is uh, familiar with the amount of money, like you take a look at what uh, welfare, for instance, gives to the average person and try to imagine yourself trying to live on that money. <laughs> Good luck, right? So my ideal is like a system that doesn't let people starve says that yes you deserve to have a, a roof over your head and food on on your table but not uh you know not not like luxuries and stuff if you want luxuries well then you're gonna have to work right um so that's where the incentive to work comes in right because you don't want to just make it to, so that nobody wants to has any reason to work anymore but uh, basic living expenses 
is not enough for most people, especially if you're in even a mixed capitalist economy, which is constantly driven by wants and needs. Everybody wants a new television, a new computer, a new phone, all of this stuff. Well, welfare is not going to pay for that stuff. Um, so, uh, and if you want to have sort of like even the best food and stuff like that, right? Well, welfare uh, uh, is not going to cover that stuff. So there's always going to be incentives for people to want to um, work. Plus, uh, just assuming that that everybody is is a dreg of humanity and is just going to sponge off the people is, um, I think, uh, incorrect. Um, so the last time I got workman's compensation, for instance, which was a, a few years ago, uh, I think I only missed uh, two or three days of work uh, because of a, a back injury that I sustained on the job. And uh, the, the um, workman's compensation person uh, that I was dealing with um, pretty much gave me everything I want. And when I, uh, you know, said I didn't need the, the support anymore. They were like sort of amazed and they said, wow, you know, uh, a lot of people would uh, would uh, milk this for everything it's worth. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, they're kind of impressed that I wasn't going to exploit the system. But there's lots of people who just, you know, wouldn't want to be sponges. Are there sponges out there? Sure. Yeah. But most people aren't. And most people have um, desires to have more than just the bare necessities of life. Right. So that's the incentive to keep on working. Um, you don't say like to, to say that, um, OK, you either work or you're going to starve to death. OK, that's where you get all of these um, um, psychologically disturbed people starving to death on the side of the road, because mental health issues are, are frequently very subtle. OK. So you can sit in a room and uh, somebody can seem to you like they're fully capable of working and, and don't have any issues that might harm them and stuff. And so you'll uh, order them to work, but then they can't work and because they've got little hidden problems that you can't see and that even a psychologist isn't necessarily always going to identify. Uh, and so they fall through the cracks. And that's the whole idea, again, about creating something to prevent people from falling through the cracks. Plus a video, and they had a deep fake to make it more favorable for them. Well, we've gotten into a state and society where um, it's getting late here. Wow. Um, almost anything could be faked now. So people have to be very careful with what they're viewing. Absolutely. Okay, so there you're wrong there, um, Ryan. So first of all, I wouldn't have a, um, I wouldn't have a, a gendered political system um, to create a sexed political system, right? where it's democratically reflective of the population, where it says, listen, women and men are different, right? And so perhaps women need to have equal representation uh, in the hallways of power, just like men. That's a democratic principle, right? And if you can come to agree with that, that's based on sex, not gender. So you're not gonna get uh, 300 uh, different genders. You're also not going to get an imbalance. We already have an imbalance in society. Right. But it's towards the male end. So if you had a system set up where it was based on the population. Right. Um, then you're not going to get like the women dominating the men or something. It's not going to happen um, because it's going to be reflective of the population, which is more or less 50 50. Well, that's a systemic and planning problem. The left is still about humanity and reason. Okay, it hasn't changed. What's happened is you've got all of these 
um, identity people that have been in some cases injected into the left to tear it down in my opinion. I think uh, the identity politics has become a methodology for destroying the left because the left with people like George Orwell, right? Noam Chomsky had very sort of powerful, convincing um, moral arguments to make that was very hard for the establishment to deal with. Like you watch a debate, for instance, between uh, uh, William, William F. Buckley and Noam Chomsky, and you can see that Noam Chomsky can hold his own. They don't want to deal with uh, Noam Chomsky's and George Orwell's and stuff, right? They would rather set up straw men, which are all these identity politic lunatics, right? And then they're, they're easy to defeat, right? Then you can get some uh, and we saw this with Jordan Peterson, uh, the TVO was putting these weakling identity politic lunatics in the debate chair with Jordan Peterson. Of course, Jordan Peterson just to tear them apart because they're idiots, right? But if you had somebody like Noam Chomsky in the other chair, you no, know, Jordan's not going to do so well, right? Yeah, because the left has traditionally had powerful... Uh, moral arguments about not letting people starve to death and, you know, caring about the little old lady down the road and these types of things, right? Um, so I would say that the, 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 the true left is still about humanity and reason. Well, the, the problem is, is right now we have um, a fake left and a fake right at the tops of our society. These are illusions. Okay, you got the uh, establishment left, and even Chomsky said this himself recently, that what we have is an establishment left and an establishment right. Okay, but what links them at the bottom is establishment, right? Establishment is that link that pulls them together, and they're both sort of ultimately controlled by the same thing. And they're slightly different uh, focuses. So the the um, the right tends to be controlled by old money, like big oil and stuff like that. Uh, the left establishment tends to be about new money, but they all sort of have similar interests in terms of how they deal with the people. Well, I mean, it's it's difficult when all of your experiences with men is that they're, you know, vicious and abusive. Uh, yeah, you can kind of understand how some women might get that way. Um, you know, what is the solution? I mean, trying to expose uh, these women to uh, examples of men who aren't mean and vicious, right? There is some confusion, um, I think, because men are biologically programmed to be sexual creatures. So that's constantly sort of causing problems in perceptions um, because a lot of women don't like to be seen as sexual objects. Um, but men are kind of wired to see them that way. Um, uh, and our society it sort of milks that to, to like totally unnatural proportions. I've talked about this before, that uh, human society now is hypersexualized. Um, so that uh, contributes to the, uh, the problem of so many men seeing women as uh, sexual objects. And if they don't see them as sexual objects, they, they don't have sort of the interest in them. And a lot of that has been fostered. Um, I think there needs to be some sort of uh, balance in there. So you need to understand that for pre uh, procreation purposes, there's going to be like, you know, sexual stuff there. The thing is not to uh, make that define what a person is and not to allow a society, like society is completely out of control as far as I'm concerned. Um, like we've gone like sexual beyond the, the boundaries of what is reasonable or safe. Like some of the pornography that's out there right now used to be illegal and should still be illegal, but it's not. It's becoming commonplace and it's dangerous. Um, so again, a lot of this is a sort of a systemic thing and it's driven by uh, profit because there are a lot of... Uh, well, we'll get into that. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, debate uh, with anybody uh, on the right that uh, uh, currently our systems are not working properly. But the, it's not that they're just not working properly for the taxpayer. They're not working properly for the people that uh, the programs are intended to support either. What they tend to work best for are the bureaucrats and the corporate establishment that, uh, uh, you know, gets wealthy off of all this public money. Okay, that's a systemic problem. Okay, so that's back to the uh, you know flaws in the machine that need to be um, uh, corrected. Uh, the answer is not to say, well, dog eat dog, everyone for themselves. That's exactly what the corporate establishment wants you to say. They want you just to forget your humanity, stop caring about the little old lady down the road, and um, you know just uh, favor a system that's less humane. Well, I'm not willing to do that. Anyway, uh, kind of got off uh, topic here. Um, what was that we were talking about? I guess I kind of talked about some of the things I wanted to talk about in the sense that uh, I, I think people need to understand that I have reached the firm conclusion at this point in my investigation after uh, three years, really, of uh, being deeply involved in this and researching it uh, forward and backwards, uh, I've come to the conclusion that part of what we're seeing with the transgender agenda today is an attempt to use it to destroy the left completely and finally. So people need to understand that there's a manipulation game that's being played here, and that's why we see so many of these right-wing pro-corporate pundits suddenly uh, coming onto the scene and, and posing themselves as heroes. Okay, What I want people to be careful about is that these corporate powers who are um, posing themselves as heroes now are at their core fascist. Okay. That's what fascism is, is this merger of government and uh, corporate power, right? Um, so you can say, okay, well, I don't care if they smash the left. I don't care if they use this to destroy the left, right? But you need to understand what that's going to leave you with, okay? That's going to leave you with nasty, brutal, fascistic corporate powers and a control state, okay? Whatever you do. Whatever your political argument is, it needs to be conducted in an open and honest manner. And what the right is doing right now is extraordinarily dishonest, and they've been getting away with it. And so part of my sort of agenda is they look, okay, all of this transgender stuff is crazy, it's nutty, needs to be corrected, but you need to understand that it's been funded and pushed by the corporate right. And now you need to ask, ask yourself, why? Part of my problems uh, with Megan Murphy have to do with her alignment with all of these corporate powers. She can point to me and say, oh, well, you were dealing with Christians and stuff. Well, yeah, I was. I was dealing with Christians at the grassroots level, right? Um, as soon as I got close to some of the, uh, the higher-ups in the uh, uh, Christian community, I immediately began to recognize I was dealing with jackals, right? And I wanted nothing like the whole... Uh, West Coast Christian Accord thing. Um, you'll if you go back in time, you'll see I made a video where I went after the leaders of the West Coast Christian Accord because as soon as you get to that level, you get into trouble. So I will deal with people on the right at the grassroots level, but when you start dealing with them at the highest levels and in their um, uh, wings of power, if you will, like the right corporate media, that's when you're becoming a full-on tool for corporate power, okay? And that's what Megan Murphy is doing. And you can see that, just look at what she's doing. She's become a tool of the right. And uh, that's a bad thing. And uh, if anybody out there doesn't like it, too bad, I don't care, okay? I speak things uh, the way I see things and I go after the truth as I see it. And if somebody doesn't like it, too bad, deal with it. And I'm not going to worry about it, okay? Uh, I had all these feminists and other people come after me and uh, continued spreading this vicious, untrue rumor about me, stalking Megan Murphy, for instance. Uh, so they can come after me and they can want to destroy me. I don't care. Okay? I don't care. 
what you can count on from me is that I will always pursue what I believe to be true. Period. And if that means I have to stand alone, it means I have to stand alone. You know, if you feel that I'm wrong about something, right, well, then convince me that I'm wrong. I don't feel that I'm wrong about Megan Murphy. I've watched Megan Murphy for a very long time, and I have come to the conclusion that Mary, Megan Murphy is compromised one way or another. That's my feeling, and I'm not going to change that feeling. Now, maybe you want to make an argument that I'm compromised. I don't know where I'm compromised. Uh, <laughs> nobody's given me any money. I'm not getting any platforms. I'm fighting uh, tooth and nail to be heard. Um, but anyway. Yeah, anytime you align with corporate... Uh, the corporate sector, that's a very dangerous thing to do. And you look at, uh, like, Megan's writing for the uh, Spectator in the United States and uh, appearing on Tucker Carlson. Everywhere she goes, it's the right-wing uh, corporate media that are, are platforming her. And you can see this in, in her uh, arguments and her approach to things. She says that she's uh, left but her talk isn't that way so you, you know it's like i didn't follow megan murphy at all until this recent blow up but i went to her uh, facebook page and i was looking at her facebook posts uh, recently trying to figure out like where she's at right now and i was noting she, you know, she's got some posts on there about you know when there's articles talking about uh, the problem with lefties and stuff like that it's like wait a sec i thought you said you were on the left what are you posting articles about lefties and stuff like that, right? So I think this is uh, beginning to have an impact on her and it might help to explain why she refuses to talk about the role of Big Pharma, who has been critical in um, like the whole transgender thing. You can't understand uh, the whole transgender thing without understanding the science that has driven this insanity into the limelight and has now been destroying so many children. You can't understand that with look, without looking at the science and who is funding the science and who is pushing the science and who is benefiting from that science. That's the pharmaceutical uh, research complex. And anybody who's addressing this issue who wants to solve the problem needs to address that. It is a difficult issue. It is an issue that will uh, result in you having jackals dispatched on you. I understand that. So it requires courage, okay? But we need people with courage, okay? I was at one of my talks and I am dead convinced that they sent some uh, pharmaceutical industry ghoul there to intimidate me. I'm not gonna get into the deal, details of that, but I understand that this is an industry that is uh, deadly serious about what they do. So there is a risk in, in doing that, but it has to be done, right? And what I have said from, from Megan Murphy uh, or about Megan Murphy is I don't expect her to do the hard work of talking about the pharmaceutical medical research complex and their role in this. I don't expect her to do that. Um, what I had hoped she would do at some point but never did and refuses to do was at least mention somebody like me who is willing to do that hard work, right? But she won't do that. So I've given up on, on Megan Murphy. Anyway, I think that's about it for now. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.